I appreciate what the majority leader has said. There is a lot going on, and uh, there's the beginning, perhaps, of uh, uh, coming together, hopefully, with the president and the uh, leadership of the House and the Senate. And I just hope that we can establish uh, why it is that there is such a divide on uh, how we accomplish the issue of raising the debt ceiling with real reforms that will assure that we will not have to raise the debt ceiling again, that we will cut deficits so that the debt will also be cut in this country. We cannot sustain the level of debt that we have now. It is the highest that we have ever had in the history of this country. And Mr. President, let's face it, we have two basic problems here. We have this looming $14 trillion debt that is about to hit the ceiling, and we have to raise the ceiling. Now, it would be irresponsible to do that without significant reforms that will assure that we're not going to hit it again. But the second problem is we have 9.1% unemployment. So it's not like we're in a vacuum here and we can just start taxing our small businesses when small business has already had the looming hit of the health care plan that was passed that is going to cost every business in this country significant increases in their cost of doing business. So when people are out there saying, well, why is unemployment still so high? Why is hiring lagging? I think it is because businesses are trying to prepare for this big hit that they're going to get in 2014 when the Obama health care plan uh, takes full effect. And they're trying to figure out, are they going to pay more for insurance or are they going to take the fine and pay fines for every employee who doesn't have insurance, which is going to cause chaos in this country. So they're trying to decide. On top of that, people on the other side of the aisle in Washington, D.C. keep talking about increasing taxes, and the president keeps talking about increasing taxes. And so no wonder our employers are not saying, oh, yes, let's just open the floodgates and bring people back to work, because they don't know what to expect. We must generate economic growth, not stifle it. We need businesses to feel confident in the future that they're going to be able to make a profit on top of all the added costs of new taxes and a health care reform that is going to hit business the hardest. So we don't have a tax problem in this country. We're not being taxed too little. This government is spending too much. That's the problem we're facing right now. That's why we have a $14 trillion debt. We have a $1.6 trillion shortfall between spending and revenue. So, you know, I'm reminded of what Ronald Reagan once said, we don't have a trillion dollar debt because we haven't taxed enough, we have a trillion dollar debt because we spend too much. Let's look at the spending side of the equation. We can't continue business as usual in Washington and fix this problem. When President Obama was sworn into office, the national debt was $10.6 trillion. It was too much then. I think we all agree. Now it's $14.3 trillion. We are weeks away from officially hitting that $14.3 trillion debt ceiling. Now, we have had a monumental addition to the unprecedented number of spending dollars 
that was the stimulus that passed in February of 2009. Today, the President's Council of Economic Advisors has, has said that 2.4 million jobs were created at a cost of $666 billion. That's about three quarters of the stimulus. That is a cost to taxpayers of $278,000 per job. Now, Mr. President, that's just not reasonable. This is the kind of spending that we cannot continue in this country. You know, I think they say they want to increase taxes, and I hear the President say we must increase taxes on the oil companies, well, increase taxes on corporate jets. Well, you know, I think if we are fair and across the board and we tax oil companies like we tax every business, sure. I think let's, let's even the playing field. If we're going to take away the, uh, the business deductions that every business gets in this country, then sure, let's take it from every business, including oil. But it's not going to help the deficit because it's not enough to help the deficit. They say they want to increase taxes in order to reduce the deficit. But what they really want is to increase taxes to permanently increase spending so that the big government that we have seen grow in the last two years, two and a half years, will be permanent. That's why they want to increase taxes. So, Mr. President, I say there's a, there's a way to fix this. First of all, we could pass a balanced budget amendment. A balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution would put us on a budget that we would have to meet, like most states in this nation and every business and every family. We would set the limits. I believe the appropriate limit would be that total federal expenditures would be limited to 18 percent of the gross domestic product. Then Congress would also have to have caps on spending, about same, 18 percent of gross domestic product. Now this would be a spending reform that we could adopt, that I believe the states would also agree to ratify, that would give us a trajectory that would eliminate this deficit and the debt in this country, and we would be on a fiscally responsible path. Second, if we're going to do this, we've got to look at entitlements. Now, that's the reality. That is the reality. We have a nearly bankrupt entitlement system that is ongoing regardless of what the revenue coming in is. The debt limit and the ongoing deficit reduction negotiations need to put entitlement reform on the table. Until yesterday, they had refused to do it. But now it seems that perhaps some entitlement reform might be on the table. For instance, one that I have introduced a bill to correct is the Social Security system. Social Security will account for one-fifth of all federal spending this year, one-fifth. The time for reform is now, and we can do it in a reasonable way. The amount of Social Security benefits being paid out exceeds the revenue that Social Security payroll is collecting, and we're starting to draw down on the Social Security reserves. When the reserves run out, in 2036, Social Security will only be able to pay out 70 percent of the benefits to current and future retirees. That is the law today. It would force a 23 percent cut in benefits. That's the law today. The Social Security Board of Trustees reported earlier this year that one way to shore up Social Security's assets is to immediately and permanently increase the combined payroll tax on employees and employers from 12.4 to 14.5 percent. 
In other words, increase payroll taxes by one-sixth during our jobless economic non-recovery. I don't think that's really feasible. The trustees also noted that the shortfall could be eliminated by an immediate and permanent 13.8 percent cut in core benefits that retirees are getting right now. An immediate $150 per month cut in every Social Security benefit check right now. That was what the Social Security trustees suggested was a possibility. Now, that is something I think we would unanimously in this United States Senate reject. No one is going to cut benefits $150 right now per month. Nobody. Nobody would do it. So, if we are going to address this, I have proposed a plan. Senator Kyle and I introduced Senate Bill 1213, the Defend and Save Social Security Act. First, everyone knows we're living longer than when the Social Security Act passed. We have a higher quality of life. People want to work longer in most areas. So, why not gradually raise the retirement age without impacting those who are about to retire? Under my bill, anyone who is 58 years of age or older will see no change. For everyone else, starting in 2016, the normal and early retirement age would increase by three months a year. So the normal retirement age would reach 67 by 2019, 68 by 2023, and 69 at 2027. And it stops there. Early retirement would be gradually, three months a year, increased to 63 by 2019 and 64 by 2023, and it would stop. Secondly, Currently, Social Security recipients receive an annual cost of living adjustment, a COLA. Under my plan, the COLA would be computed as it is in current law, reduced 1%. So, the average rate of inflation in COLA has been 2.2% excuse me, every year of an increase. So if we have a 2.2% rate of inflation COLA, it would be a 1.2% increase in Social Security benefits. So what I'm saying is that a 1% decrease in the COLA is just a 1% increase in the, a 1% decrease in the increase so that you would have the gradual raising of the age that would be much more in line with our actuarial table and the reality today where people are living much longer and you would also have a slight decrease in the increase in social security benefits according to inflation. If we have rampant inflation then you would have the COLA just a 1% less. So if it's 2.2% inflation, then you would get a 1.2% COLA. Doing that saves the Social Security system and it closes the 75-year gap. It doesn't raise taxes on anyone and it doesn't cut a core benefit for anyone. That is the way we could fix Social Security right now. And what would that do for our deficit? Here's what it would do. It would achieve a $416 billion reduction over the next 10 years of our deficit and a $7.2 trillion savings by 2085. So that means we're on the track. That means in 75 years, Social Security will be solid and secure without a tax increase on anyone, and without a cut in core benefits to anyone, and no one who is 58 years of age or older will have any adjustment whatsoever. So, in the age, 
whatsoever. So, Mr. President, we have a chance to do some things. Now, I've, I've gone out and said, here's a proposal. My colleague, Senator Corker, has proposed a limit, a cap on spending that is a reasonable limit. Uh, other colleagues, Senator Lee, Senator Paul, uh, have suggested, and Senator Toomey, have suggested other ways to cut spending across the board, just a level goal. They're not cutting specific things, but they're cutting the discretionary spending at reasonable levels. Many Republicans are offering ways to cut back on spending. My colleague, Senator Cornyn from Texas, has put forward a cap on spending and a balanced budget amendment. There are proposals out there that are responsible ways to deal with this deficit that include entitlements and discretionary spending both. It is time, Mr. President, for the President of the United States to sit down at the table and understand that tax increases for kind of a photo op uh, PR are not going to fill the void. The public relations of cutting back on corporate jet benefits, whatever they are, I don't know what they are, don't have one, but you know, I think we'd probably all agree. If you can afford a corporate jet or a private jet, you know, fine. Whatever the president wants to do, we'll do it. And it will do nothing to help the deficit. So why don't we do the meaningful things which is make meaningful cuts in discretionary spending. Let's attack what everybody knows is the case, and that is Social Security is going bankrupt as we speak. And if Congress and the President will speak responsibly about it, we can put that on a glide path that is within the reasonable actuarial table estimate so that people will work longer, very gradually increase starting in 2016, ending in 2027 at 69. That's gradual. So, Mr. President, we can't procrastinate. We can't wait. We can't hope the crisis will pass. And we cannot delay the inevitable. This is the United States Senate. We were elected to make the tough choices. It is time for us to do it. Thank you, Mr. President. And I yield the floor. Mr. President, Senator from Pennsylvania is recognized.